Okay, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our first talk in 2022. Uh, today, we are very honored to have Dr. James Radio to give us a talk on Maxwell's theory for us regular folks. So I'm gonna go over Dr. Radio's uh, bio. Uh, Dr. Radio received his uh, BSCE degree from Cornell University in 1978 and the MS degree in system engineering from University of Pennsylvania in 1981, and a PhD degree under Professor Roger Harrington in electrical engineering from Syracuse University in 1986. From 1978 to 1986, he was with uh, General Electric, initially with the Vary Forge Space Division, then with the Syracuse Electronics Laboratory. During this time, he developed the microwave design and the measurement software and designed microwave circuits on alumina and the gallium isonide. From 1986 to 1988, he was a visiting professor with Syracuse University and Cornell University. In 1988, he took a Sonnet software full-time, a company he had founded in 1983. In 1995, Sonnet software was listed on the Inc. 500 list of the fastest growing private health U.S. companies, the first microwave software company ever to be so listed. Today, Sony Software is a leading vendor of high accuracy, three dimensional planar high frequency electromagnetic analysis uh, software based on Maxwell's uh, equation. Dr. Rodio was the recipient of a 2001 IEEE Microwave Theory and Techniques Society Microwave Application Award, 2014 Distinguished Service Award, and a 2019 Career Award. He was appointed MTT Distinguished Microwave Lecturer from 2005 to uh, 2007, lecturing on the life of uh, James Clark Maxwell, and it has had a major influence in the restoration of Clark Maxwell's home, Glen Nair. He is also a trustee of James Clark Maxwell Foundation, which promotes Maxwell and maintains Maxwell's birthplace in Edinburgh. It's a museum of his life. He is a fellow of REEE and RSD. Welcome, Dr. Rodio. Uh, please. Uh, the talk. Thank you. Very fine. Thank you, Jeff. Um, do I have to do a share here, or is uh, that already uh, you done? You are already sharing. I think. It's okay. Good. So you've got you've got the whole screen here now. You've got my PowerPoint displayed, right? Uh, yes. Yep. Yep. Okay. Very good. Maxwell's theory for us regular folks. I've been uh, immersed in uh, equations as long as your arm. For the last 40 years, uh, lots of mathematics in Maxwell's theory. It's famous for uh, being the terror of uh, you know many engineering sophomores' years. Um, but uh, no one, you really don't understand any theory unless you can explain it without mathematics. The mathematics is important for uh, using the theory and coming up with uh, numbers. You're nobody unless somebody gives you a number in engineering. And uh, the theory will give us numbers, but uh, you've got to understand it first. You have to be able to explain. Uh, 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 ext extensive mathematical background. Uh, so this will be useful for people who two two kinds of people: people who don't have the mathematics would like to understand. And also, for those of you who are electromagnetic gurus who really understand this stuff very well, you will also have uh, situations where you need to, where it's helpful to explain Maxwell's theory to, to people who don't have the mathematics. Feel free to borrow and use any of the uh, uh, concepts and ideas that I, I use in this presentation when you encounter the similar situation. So, uh, in introduction here. Discover, I'm going to discuss discoveries that build up to Maxwell's theory. I'm going to emphasize concepts and understanding, no, absolutely no equations. And I'll give some book suggestions for further reading, a couple of the books I actually have something to do with. And uh, sites to see if you go there. I highly recommend, recommend putting Edinburgh on your uh, uh, bucket list to go see sometime, especially if you spent a lot of time working with uh, microwaves, electromagnetics, and or Maxwell's equations. The ancients had static electricity. Now, the way this was uh, first shown to me in my senior year 
physics class in high school was a, a, a pelt of a cat in amber. I don't have any amber. And my wife and kids dearly love cats. So using a pelt is just not possible. I have to find some other way. So what we, uh, uh, we found another way, use the entire cat. Cat was not harmed. It did this on its own and uh, probably was a very educational experience for the cat. All the uh, styro ancients didn't have styrofoam either, but uh, it's an excellent illustration of, of uh, static electricity. After we get done with chuckling on this, think about it. When the ancients see something like this, uh, bits of paper attracted to an amber rod, and what we see is styrofoam attracted to a cat. Why is that? How is that happening? You can actually build up enough static electricity to get a, get a spark. A, a fairly substantial spark at times. Uh, this must be some sort of fluid or what? Uh, ancient um, uh, 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 Thales of Miletius in the 16, 600 uh, B, 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 uh, BCE, I probably pronounced it wrong, is uh, uh, just thought it as a curiosity, didn't pursue it further. So we got this, this uh, uh, we know it's static electricity. They don't know. They don't know what it is. It's a real puzzle. What the heck is going on? And they also had magnetism. Uh, lightning strikes some iron ore and magnetizes the iron, and it attracts other bits of iron. And what's doing it? Really strange. Don't know why. And uh, no, no connection between electricity and magnetism was realized other than uh, they just did really magical things. Well, mysterious magic is what they were. Galvani uh, reported uh, frog's legs twitching on a rack. He attributed it to some sort of bioelectricity. And now Volta, uh, inspired by Galvani's report, said, well, no, it's not, not coming from the frog's legs. Maybe it's coming from outside the frog legs the rack that's holding the frog legs. So he experimented quite a bit and put made a stack of uh, lead and zinc and uh, with uh, 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 some insulation in between them and was able to get a very sizable uh, amount of electricity here, a constant flow of electricity, not just a zap, but uh, a constant flow of electricity for as long as the battery would last. And now you can all do all sorts of uh, scientific experiments, which I'll, I'll describe a couple here in a second. But they also was quite popular for uh, uh, parties and gatherings. Uh, they would uh, uh, hear everybody hold on to this battery and we'll cure your headache, we'll cure your muscle pains, zap. Oh, oh my headache's gone. Well, I guess maybe the pain of the, of the zap is enough. You forget about the headache. But uh, they, they had a lot of fun with it uh, as a, essentially party tricks. The scientists are doing some things with this too. And uh, Hans Christian Orsted in 1820 used electricity to create a magnet. Amazing, we've got uh, a way to convert electricity into a magnet now. And he did that by noting a loop of wire from one of the batteries would uh, twist a compass needle. Now this is really weird because they, they know gravity at the time, gravity pulls, they know static electricity, static electricity either pushes or pulls. So they said, well, there must be two kinds of static electricity. One pushes and one pulls. But uh, this um, elect electromagnet, it reaches out and twists things. It twists the compass needle, pushes on one end and pulls on the other end. That's really weird. Why is that? And just as a uh, parenthetical note, the blue arrows here indicate the direction of the electrons. When we uh, calculate uh, uh, electric current flow mathematically on the computer, uh, we, we, uh, uh, electrons are negative. We, we uh, uh, have the directions opposite. We put the negative side on the current instead of on the electron. So the uh, the uh, arrow for uh, the way we calculate current today would be in the opposite direction. But it's the same physical situation. Today, kids even make use of this making nail magnets. 
the youngster makes this magnet, it doesn't work. Mommy, mommy, my magnet won't work. What's wrong? Mommy says, oh, dear little one, Maxwell taught us that current must always and forever flow in complete loops. All we have to do is complete the loop. And now the magnet works. That's amazing. A very simple concept for us, but uh, it's, also, it's actually something I've seen some people, sometimes uh, people ignore. Uh, for example, I've seen uh, silicon RFIC inductors, basically what this is, only it's not on silicon. And uh, they forget about that return current path. If you calculate the inductance, you have to have current flowing around an entire loop and you calculate the flux flowing through the entire loop. If you don't have a complete loop, like the inductor comes in on one end and goes out on the other, uh, electricity will complete the loop or the inductor won't work. And uh, whatever, if it completes it through your circuit, uh, it could be problems. So that, that's, a, that's, a, that's something we sometimes forget. Uh, current, the current must always flow in complete loops. Okay, no complete loop, no current. Well, uh, nature likes symmetry, so um, does it work in reverse? Uh, electricity makes a magnet. Maybe a magnet could make electricity. Michael Faraday worked on this problem. I'll, I'll uh, digress here for a bit on uh, Faraday. Amazing story. Uh, he, he was born in a very poor family. His father was a blacksmith. His father died when Faraday was young. Faraday was apprenticed to a bookkeeper. I'm sorry, a bookbinder. The book binder, he started reading the books he was binding. One of them was the Encyclopedia Britannica. He was reading articles on electricity and magnetism and chemistry too. He became a famous chemist. And he was absolutely enthralled with this and the story of how he uh, went from a self-educated uh, poor family to being one of the foremost scientists of, uh, of uh, Britain is an amazing story. I, I highly recommend, for example, the Wikipedia article on Faraday. Uh, absolutely amazing and inspiring. But okay, Faraday tries this problem. Uh, does a magnet make electricity? Well, we've got a magnet on the left here and it's working because it's picked up all the washers. Currently, we got a complete loop of current, but nothing is happening on the right. Magnet is not making electricity. Faraday tries all sorts of things, tries this, that, and the other thing. Doesn't work. Well, okay, sometimes we just have to fake defeat. Uh, nature works the way nature wants, not necessarily the way we think it works. And um, uh, so, you know, it's, you know, uh, admit defeat, get on with life, and do something else. End of experiment, let's say this battery open. Oh, oh my gosh, what happened? Uh, did that, anyone see what happened? I, a couple of you did. Let's, let's, let's do this again. Something really weird happened. Maybe we could ignore it and just go on. Or maybe it's something we need to track down. Let's, let's um, go ahead and uh, connect the magnet back up and see what happens to the meter needle. Watch carefully. Whoa, meter needle. We got electricity for a little bit and then it uh, slowly, exponentially decayed away. What the heck is going on? Let's try this again. Okay, we'll, oh, there's no electricity. We'll open up the, the magnet is off. There's no magnetism in that magnet and the meter needle is moving. What the heck is happening? We'll connect it back up. It moves again in the other direction. Okay, so Faraday sits down and thinks, no mathematical ability. He, Matt, Faraday was never trained in mathematics, but he had incredible physical intuition. So Faraday goes into this wild speculation that some sort of mysterious, invisible, electrotonic state surrounds the magnets. Uh, a lot of people say, Faraday, you're nuts. You're crazy. That isn't, that is no, like, I don't see anything around the magnet, there's no electronics, electrotonic state. Um, today uh, we call this, uh, well, 
Uh, I'll call it magnetic field for short here. Uh, those of you who are electromagnetics experts uh, will recognize that it, it, it's the um, actually the uh, magnetic vector potential, but we'll call it magnetic field for short. So this electro electrotonic state uh, is uh, basically a magnetic field. And what Faraday speculates is it is not the, the electrotonic state, not the magnetic field that causes these amazing electromagnetic effects. It's changes in this state that cause these electromagnetic effects. Changes, those of you who have uh, 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 any calculus at all, changes is the key word here. An equation should come up in your head instantly when I say changes, changes with time. Uh, and we can make these changes in time just by moving the magnet, as we see in the in this uh, lower image. You can pop the uh, the smaller coil into the big one and get uh, get electricity coming out. And um, so it's uh, this this leads uh, Faraday to inventing the motor, inventing the generator. Now we can hook up the generator to a water wheel, perhaps, and have a constant source of electricity which drives a motor. Uh, th this is really neat stuff here because they did not have any of this with that steam engine, but uh, didn't have anything else. Oh, heck, let's hook up a steam engine to the to the generator. Uh, 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 interesting story about when Faraday invented uh, the motor. It was a very simple contraption. He wrote a paper on it, and his uh, sponsor at the the Royal Institution, which is where where uh, he, he made a lot of his fame. Uh, the boss, the, the head head honcho there, Humphrey Davies, uh, he forgot to reference, give give uh, uh, Davy uh, a reference in the paper. So Davy got real upset, shut Faraday down on electromagnetics for about 10 years. Uh, Faraday went on and did all kinds of amazing things in chemistry, inventing benz, discovering benzene, for example. But uh, it was about 10 years later that he returns to um, electromagnetics and and uh, uh, continues with a with a creation of the motor and a generator and his uh, additional researches, including including also making uh, Maxwell becoming aware of uh, what what Faraday had done. Faraday's intuition, in order to use it, has to be converted into equations. Faraday has no mathematical ability. Maxwell is excited by what Faraday has reported. And uh, he learns about EM research done by Faraday, Ampere in France, Orsted, Volta uh, in Italy and others. Maxwell even traveled to Italy, learned Italian specifically for his trip to Italy so he could speak with uh, Italian uh, electromagnetics researchers. And uh, 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 he uh, he could uh, uh, learn German, uh, read a lot of German research. He did comment that uh, the Germans were a bit difficult to understand, but uh, but he powered through that research as well. And uh, Faraday's intuition that electrotonic state changing makes electricity, Maxwell converted into math. And in, uh, Faraday is credited with with uh, inventing the concept of a field with his electrotonic state. A field is a vector defined over a space. And uh, uh, so a magnetic field in Maxwell's math makes electric field, uh, not just any magnetic field, a changing electric field. A changing magnetic field makes electric field. But how about reverse? Again, we come back to this nature loves symmetry. Maybe there's symmetry here. Would a changing electric field make a magnetic field? Don't know. And so Maxwell, there's no experimental evidence to support this. Maxwell put it in his equations. And uh, we can illustrate what he put in here conceptually. On the capacitor on the right, you see electric current flows in the top and out the bottom lead. And we'll make this a sinusoidal electric current. It's uh, like, like the AC in your uh, uh, 60 hertz uh, AC outlet or the um, the radio frequencies coming out of your Wi-Fi or a transmitter, it's oscillating back and forth. So half a cycle later, these arrows would all reverse direction. And every half cycle, they reverse direction. So it's an oscillating electric current. That current creates a magnetic field in the wire coming in. 
it creates a magnetic field surrounding it and the wire coming out. If you know the right hand rule, the right hand rule is what, uh, what determines the direction of the magnetic field given the direction of the current. And uh, in the dielectric, we have a changing electric field, but there's no magnetic field around there and there's no current. It's an insulator, okay? There's no current through there, but we have to have current flowing in a complete loop. So uh, Maxwell thought for a bit and said, well, how about that changing electric field is a current? And he called it displacement current. And the changing electric field with the red arrows in the dielectric there. It's, and remember, it's reversing direction every half cycle. The changing electric field creates a magnetic field around it that is exactly the same as if the current in the wire were flowing through there. It's called a displacement current. One way to visualize that is atoms have electrons surrounding them, and this electric field keeps changing direction. Current, that displacement current. What is really wild, and I still don't understand it, I wondered about it when I first saw this as a, as a junior in, in college. Uh, what happens if you have, instead of dielectric, if you have pure vacuum in there? And what happens is it's a little bit reduced, but you get the same thing. The magnetic field surrounding the dielectric is just like an electric current flowing in the dielectric, the displacement current, even though there's no atoms, there's nothing in there. How does that happen? I still don't know. It's, it's, it's absolutely amazing. Okay, now we, I'm a ham radio operator and uh, even have my, my HT right here. And um, HT is handheld transceiver. This is a handheld transceiver here. Uh, some people call it walkie talkie. And it generates, has an RF amplifier in there, and it generates a voltage across the antenna terminals. If you have a, a one volt across one centimeter, that's one volt per centimeter. If it's 10 volts, it's 10 volts per centimeter. The electric field at that point is indicated by the arrow. Now, I emphasize that the electric field is not an arrow that sticks out of the HT. The length of the arrow indicates the, the uh, magnitude of the electric field at that point. So uh, the electric field varies sinusoidally. Let's run through that again. It decreases to zero, goes through zero, goes in the opposite direction. And then it uh, goes back up to where it was. That's one cycle, actually a cosine wave. But uh, we often call it a sine wave. And uh, so we've got a changing electric field, changing with time, changing with time. That's a key phrase for, uh, those who know calculus, it's changing with time. <coughs> Excuse me, the electric field is changing with time. An electric field that changes with time creates a magnetic field like this. That electric field reverses direction and then goes back to where it was. That's one cycle and it just keeps repeating cycle after cycle. The electric field creates, follow the green arrow, creates a magnetic field. And what's amazing, this is this came out of Maxwell's equations. This is exact in Maxwell's equations. The magnetic field is always exactly at right angles to the electric field. Not approximately, not you know, not not 89.99 degrees. It is 90 degrees to the electric field. That's amazing. How does it do that? I don't know. That, that's amazing. That, that, that comes out of Maxwell's equation, and we see that experimentally. So I'll go through that one more time. The changing electric field creates a magnetic field. But now how about this symmetry thing? Does a changing magnetic field create an electric field? Changing, the changing electric field changes with time. It changes and creates a magnetic field that not only changes with time but changes with distance. So you can see a little bit, a little bit, a, a little bit later, this is an electric field that started out at the HT, and now it's over here. And the new uh, magnetic field is a little bit shorter. It's changed with distance. The magnetic field is changing with distance. So an electric field that changes with time creates a magnetic field 
that changes with distance. How far, you might ask? Well, we'll get into that. Electric field changing with time creates a magnetic field that changes with distance. And it's symmetric. The magnetic field that is changing with time, the magnetic field is changing with time because the electric field that generates it is changing with time. This is quite a tap dance. The magnetic field is changing with time, creates an electric field that changes with distance. Look at that. It's changed with distance. And at exactly the right angles, at exactly right angles. This, this, this is incredible. How does that work? Each electric field creates more magnet changing with time, creates more magnetic field changing with distance. And each magnetic field changing with time creates more electric field that changes with distance. And where does this end? It goes on and on and on. I spent a lot of time doing this animation. The animation tools in PowerPoint are kind of difficult to use, but uh, I was successful. There it goes. Each electric field changing with time creates magnetic field changing with distance. Each magnetic field changing with distance creates electric field changing with time. And it goes on and on and on and on. It goes on forever as long as nothing gets in the way. Okay, that's quite a claim. How about experimental evidence of that? How long, what's the longest traveling electromagnetic wave we have ever detected as humans? The universe is 13.7 billion years old. And the Hubble, this is the Hubble uh, ultra deep field. And uh, inside this little square, there's a little tiny galaxy. And over here, the little galaxy is um, on the top right, the little galaxy is a red smudge. And down the bottom right, uh, zoomed in on the little galaxy. That galaxy, uh, measured by looking at the redshift of hydrogen, is 13 point, that light has been traveling for 13.2 billion years. And with a James Webb telescope, they should be able to see stuff going back to 13.5 billion years, I believe, is the is how far they expect to get back with a with a James Webb uh, telescope. That is successfully deployed, by the way. And uh, uh, JPL there in the San Diego area had a had I'm sure had a lot to do with that. You should be quite proud. I think JPL did. I'm not sure. Um, okay, so. I've spent all this time telling you about Maxwell's theory and how beautiful and fantastic it is. So with electromagnetic theory, we can solve a large number of problems essentially exactly. In no other field of science can we do that. Essentially, I said, essentially exactly. Maxwell's theory is wrong. And uh, there are uh, professional electromagnetics people who become very upset when I tell them that. And I point out, they say, oh, okay, when does it fail? Well, it fails for low power, you know, low power. No, even lower by very, very, very low power. And basically, second bullet, there are no photons in Maxwell's theory. Electromagnetic energy is quantized. You can have one photon worth of energy or two photons of energy. You can't have 1.38 photons worth of energy. And that's not in Max. In Maxwell's theory, you could have 1.38 photons worth of energy. So with that restriction, uh, Maxwell's theory is essentially exact. Uh, in uh, computational fluid dynamics, for example, you have to worry about um, uh, 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 nonlinear nonlinear effects. And um, uh, what is exact to uh, present knowledge, there's probably something wrong with it somewhere at some point, and somebody will get a Nobel Prize for figuring out what, what's wrong, is QED quantum electrodynamics. That includes photons and all other electromagnetic effects. Everything in Maxwell's theory is included in quantum electrodynamics and quantization of photons. It's very complex. It's not useful for uh, doing microwave circuits at, at all, unless, unless you're down to individual photons, then you have to work through it. I, I got a, um, a text once on a quantum electrodynamics. I didn't get past the first page. It's uh, very difficult. And uh, I was not up to it. If you want to learn about quantum electrodynamics, the book here on the right, QED, The Strange Theory of Matter and Light by Richard Feynman. That is a beautiful read. Uh, it's a little bit technical, but no equations. And if you're enjoying, if you're enjoying this presentation, you will 
you will enjoy that that book uh, by Richard Feynman, famous physicist, very famous for explaining things for uh, just us everyday folks. Uh, since we don't deal in microwaves, we don't deal with individual photons most of the time. Maxwell's theory is essentially exact, worked really well. Now here's a book I had a little something to do with. It's Maxwell's biography, published in 1882 by authors who knew Maxwell personally. Campbell, Lewis Campbell grew up with Maxwell, and William Garnett worked with him uh, professionally. And uh, uh, it's in the rare book rooms of large libraries only. I got hold of a copy, scanned, OCR'd it, and uh, formatted it and uh, put it up uh, on Amazon. Uh, it added some extra material in it as well. So that's the illustrated part in the title. So there's a couple couple of versions of this on the, on Amazon. Uh, uh, include illustrated in, in the title and you'll come up with the one that I, that I worked on. Uh, on Amazon and Kindle paperback and hardcover. And I also have a, uh, probably half a dozen or more articles on our company website, sonnetsoftware.com. Dot com. Uh, feel free to uh, check those out if you'd like to learn more about Maxwell. <clears throat> the uh, picture there is Glenn Lair, Maxwell's uh, 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 estate. He would go there uh, uh, any chance he got, uh, which was quite a bit of the time. Uh, if you want to read about what I've been doing in electromagnetics, I, I spent my uh, 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 first part of COVID uh, uh, working uh, intensely on uh, writing up every bit of electromagnetic theory I've developed over the last 40 years. And I put that in this book. If you're okay with some math, it, uh, you know, uh, uh, high school, college prep math ought to be adequate. Uh, you can read about everything I've developed. The equations are all there, derivations are all there. You can, if, if you feel like uh, programming something, you can even program them up and, and uh, develop your own electromagnetic um, analysis of planar circuits. And uh, numerous anecdotes uh, about things that have happened over the last four decades I've put here and there in the book. Uh, you'll get a chuckle out of them if you're interested in this area. And uh, there's also two Easter eggs in, in the book too. Why is that maple leaf on the cover? And what is the background here with a background pattern that's used? What is that? Easter eggs in the book if you wanna, if you really wanna search for them. It's on Amazon in paperback and hardcover. Uh, if you go to Scotland, and I highly recommend it, put it on your bucket list if you haven't already, be sure and visit the Maxwell statue. It's on the end of George Street in what they call the New Town, right near the Royal Society of Edinburgh, in fact. And uh, uh, it's a very inspiring statue to see, beautifully done. And I wrote an article about the statue. It's on our sonnetsoftware.com and you and I triply explore too. And a spoiler alert, the name of Maxwell's dog is Toby. That's important in the article. And if you read that article all the way to the end, and uh, Toby plays an important role at the end, if you can do that without a tear in your eye at the end, you're stronger than I am. Maxwell's birth home. 14 India Street, short walk from the statue. Beautiful museum on the first and second floors. The third floor is rented out to a mathematics organization. The, the basement is uh, re re rented out to a, a private individual. In uh, Britain, of course, they, it's uh, uh, the, um, this is the, the first floor, we call the first floor would be the zero floor, I guess, ground floor, and then the, the first floor and second floor. So, uh, uh, just a different, different number. Do you start at zero or do you start at one? It's like a, a C versus Fortran. Uh, beautiful museum on the on the uh, two middle floors there. Uh, if you are into Maxwell and electromagnetics all, at all, plan on spending at least four hours a whole day if you're really into it. And I'll call ahead because it's not open on regular hours, but they're thrilled to uh, uh, host visitors and uh, answer your questions and uh, guide you around. Uh, very nice virtual tour at the uh, foundation's uh, website. Clark, and, and British pronounce it Clark, like the American pronunciation pretends the E, pretend the E is an A. It's the Clark Maxwell Foundation, of which I'm a trustee, and uh, a, a lot of very good people do a lot of very good work there. I highly recommend uh, checking out the website. There's a tremendous amount of information, actual information on the website itself. 
This is Glenn Lair. The first time I saw it, I think it was about 2006 or something like that. Fire had destroyed a good part of uh, the building. The pointing, the, the concrete between the stones was wearing out. Uh, it was, uh, you know, within a few years of being just a mass of rubble. Uh, this was unacceptable. So uh, I got together with a few other people. We, we kicked in some money and uh, the owner of Glen Lair, Captain Duncan Ferguson, retired British Navy, um, uh, actually oversaw a restoration of much of it. And his son, Angus Ferguson, has helped quite a bit as well uh, in latter stages here. A funny story with Captain Ferguson. He's trained as an electrical engineer and he went to his professor when they introduced Maxwell's equations after the lecture and said, um, I live on Maxwell's estate. Uh, he did. Professor did not believe him, but he did. If you go here, you can uh, uh, you can do all kinds of things. There's a duck pond that it features prominently in the in the biography. You can you can view the duck pond. There's a swimming hole in the nearby river that uh, Maxwell often swam in. If if you can handle the cold water, you can go for a swim there even if you want. This is what it looks like today. The right side has been restored as a private residence by uh, Angus Ferguson, who's been a very successful entrepreneur. And the left side is uh, the great room, the, the, the large portion of the house that was built by Maxwell himself. The uh, foyer, you go up the steps in the front on the left side there, uh, just, just past the green car, go up those steps and a very nice uh, foyer with um, uh, uh, many Maxwell artifacts in there, and the floor also, I think, uh, as has to do with uh, the electromagnetic theory of light and uh, red, green, and blue. Maxwell figured out red, green, and blue are the uh, primary colors of light. And he, Maxwell actually created the very first color photograph. Many other things about Maxwell, too, you'll read about in the biography and in various other materials. If you are driving from Edinburgh, stop in Lockerbie. I'm a, a, a graduate of Syracuse University, and a great tragedy occurred there. Uh, very appropriately honored. And be sure and take a GPS if you drive yourself. Uh, it's easy to get lost. This is about uh, oh, two and a half hours or so from Edinburgh. Uh, the picture here is a sketch of Maxwell when he was two years old uh, by uh, his cousin Jemima Wedderburn, married named Blackburn. Uh, and uh, she was a world-class artist, and she also had owls. So the owl, you can see, is quite terrified, and Maxwell looks his typical mischievous self. Uh, the ancients, in conclusion, the ancients knew about static electricity and magnetism. Volta developed the battery. Orsted discovered electricity. like 20 equations and 20 variables with ma the, the magnetic vector potential is primary. Oliver Heaviside, you may have heard of the Heaviside later, which is the early name for the, for the ionosphere. Uh, Heaviside actually put it into today's modern form with four equations of vector calculus. Maxwell did not have vector calculus to work with. And this theory has been absolutely critical in creating today's technology, cell phones, satellites, just the computers, everything, uh, which is why uh, historians consider Maxwell to be one of the three greatest scientists ever to have lived, along with Einstein and Newton. Thank you for your kind attention. I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Radio. Talk. Everyone. If there are any questions, uh, please type in the QA box. You can maybe raise your hand. The first question was a quick question. So, in the near field, are uh, not E and B 90 degree out of phase, whereas by the time you get into the far field, they are in phase? Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the electric and magnet in Maxwell's equations, the electric and magnetic fields. Uh, unless uh, uh, unless you're in a um, in free space, in free space, <coughs> excuse me, electric and magnetic fields are always uh, always at right angles, near field and far field. 
I'll bring bring this up again here. They're always at right angles and always in phase in free space uh, for a traveling wave. Where they go out of phase is when you have a standing wave. See, this, this is a wave and it's traveling. Now, if we put a, uh, a, sheet, a sheet of metal here on the far end, the far end of this display, that will change our, make a reflected wave, which will propagate in the opposite direction. And they will add and subtract so that you have a standing wave, a wave where the, the peaks and the zeros stay in the same place. In this case, the uh, electric field and magnetic fields are 90 degrees, precisely 90 degrees out of phase for a perfect pure standing wave. Uh, but uh, 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 for a linear, for linear media in free space or normal dielectric, electric and magnetic fields for a traveling wave are always in phase. Now, the reason they could be out of phase in the near field, if you have a near field, there's uh, uh, the, um, uh, I'm trying to think how to describe this without using a lot of mathematics, but um, as the traveling wave tries to get out into free space, uh, it's uh, reactive. Uh, there's, you know, you push out a little bit, and uh, some, and it pushes back because you don't have the 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 size of the wave must be on the order of the wavelength. Otherwise, um, it's what's called evanescent, and there's an evanescent portion to the wave that makes a make it basically makes a reflected wave. Uh, uh, reverting to use of mathematics here, the spherical harmonics, the impedance of uh, spherical harmonics, i.e. the ratio of uh, E to H in a spherical harmonic in a region that is small compared to wavelength it is complex. But when you get uh, into free space where everything is uh, open and it just, just keeps on traveling, the electric and magnetic fields are exactly in phase and uh, always uh, 90 degrees to each other, no matter where you are, no matter what the situation, they're always uh, 90 pointed 90 degrees, exactly 90 degrees away from each other. I hope that kind of answers the question. Uh, yes, it does, yes. Uh, uh, can you uh, take questions from the chat window so I can take uh, from the QA window? Uh, I, I've just got, uh, the little window up here. I don't know what to um, what to do. I don't oh, have the um, full screen. Uh, I'm uh, asking Albert actually. Oh, okay. Hey, Jeff. Yeah. Hey, uh, yeah. Uh, can you moderate the question from the chat window so I can focus on the QA window? Where we got sure. questions in both the windows. Uh, actually, the question on questions. the chat window is only asking whether this presentation being recorded. There's not many questions. Uh, no, I think we can focus on the QA, uh, QA window. Uh, actually, there's one uh, in the chat window uh, from Professor Gupta. Uh, he asked, if the, uh, this slide shows the electric and the magnetic fields in phase. They become maximum at the same time. But the time derivative of a sine wave is a cosine wave, which is 90 degree out of phase. So that's his comment. Very, very good question. This one puzzled me for a while too, uh, back in back in the early days when I was first getting familiar with things. But uh, if you look at if if you I'll, I'll refer to some mathematics here. I'll refer to the math. I'll, I'll do it do it uh, with with words and concepts here. Uh, uh, electric field changing with time creates a magnetic field that changes with distance. Now, if you go to Maxwell's equations, if, if you're not mathematic, turn your ears off for a second. If you go to Maxwell's equations, it's uh, the uh, uh, curl of the electric field, that's d by dx, d by dy, d by dz, creates the d by dt. So d by dt of e creates, for example, d by dx of h. 
And so it, and it's D by DT of H or B that creates the D by DX of E. So that's how they're in phase. But in a, a free space, the impedance of free space is pure real. And when it's pure real, that means the electric field and magnetic field are exactly in phase. They're oscillating exactly uh, uh, together. Now, in a standing wave, as I mentioned earlier, in a standing wave, they're, op they're oscillating 90 degrees out of phase. When one is a peak, the other will be a minimum and vice versa. That's on a standing wave. In a traveling wave, they are exactly in phase. Great, thanks, Jim. Um, uh, uh, Tom Liu is asking, can you go over the EM propagation with the uh, distance argument? For example, what is a good intuitive explanation for why the direction is a perpendicular to the EM vector? I didn't understand what it would allow you to just draw the displaced vector, i.e. along the distance axis. Yeah, that actually was a big puzzle early on. The uh, electric and magnetic vibrations, they're both at right angles to each other, and they're also at right angles to the direction of propagation. Now, a sound wave, for example, that's a longitudinal wave. Uh, when you, the sound that I'm making that is going to the microphone and going to your ears, that's a pressure wave. The vibration goes to, towards the direction of propagation and away. The pressure, the air, the air molecules are moving toward and away from the source to the listener. That's a longitudinal vibration along the length of the direction. Light, on the other hand, is a transverse vibration. The electric waves and the magnetic waves are vibrating transverse to the direction of propagation. And that's a big puzzle because um, transverse waves can propagate in uh, media that have shear strength. For example, if you have an iron rod, you hit it on one end, uh, you send a pressure wave down the rod. You can also hit it on the side and send a wave going sideways. Or I like to play cello. I draw the, 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 the bow across the string, the string has uh, it has shear, str shear strength. So the string vibrates sideways, transversely. But the air has no shear strength. If you try to launch a, uh, a vibration in air that has uh, uh, as transverse, that don't go because this vibrating air doesn't create any vibrating air next on. Pressure here creates pressure going on. And in a string on the cello, uh, sideways pressure on this one part of the string Make sideways pressure on the next, on the next, on the next. So first, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, digress here for just a little bit historically. How they knew it was trans, light was transverse. If it's a wave, it's a transverse wave. How did they know that? Well, they had something called Iceland spar, which is a crystalline form of calcite. You take a chunk of Iceland spar. I've got a couple chunks, in fact. And uh, you look at a line on a piece of paper, you see double. If you see double, that means there must be two kinds of waves of light. The only way you can have two kinds of waves of light is if it's a transverse wave, uh, vibrating right and left, vibrating up and down. So light must be a transverse wave, but uh, they, they figure, well, it propagates in a, well, it's got to propagate in a medium. They have no idea what the medium is. You can't see it, smell it, taste it, or anything. But uh, it must be there because they don't know of any wave that doesn't propagate in the medium. So, but the luminiferous ether must not have any shear strength because the earth goes around the sun and the earth does not spiral down into the sun. Earth keeps going. So this medium can't have any shear strength. How can you have a transverse wave in a medium that has no shear strength? Well, that was a big puzzle. And um, now why light is a transverse wave? I don't know, I'm not sure anybody knows. But from experimental work, combined with Faraday's intuition, combined with Maxwell's incredible mathematical abilities, is able to synthesize a theory. The theory has 
the E and H as transverse, so that's consistent with what we see in the, uh, the Iceland spar, the double line. It must be a transverse wave. It is a transverse wave in this theory. And it propagates with the speed of light. When Maxwell first calculated the speed of this electromagnetic wave, he had what corresponds today to epsilon and mu. He had something different. And he calculated the speed of this transverse wave, and it turned out to be almost identical to the speed, measured speed of light that was known at that time. He said light must be an electromagnetic wave. And uh, it has all these characteristics. Now, why it has these characteristics? I don't know. I don't think anyone knows. It's just a, one thing I like to say sometimes is we are fortunate to have been born into the most incredible universe known to humankind. I ho hope that at least somewhat answers your question. Thank you, James. There's a couple more questions uh, in the audience. Uh, uh, can you comment on when to use a linear model versus modeling? Not sure what the modeling is here. But... When, when to use, when to a, use linear a linear model, model versus a model? Okay. Uh, well, there are linear models and nonlinear modeling, so I'm not not clear on what the what the question is. Uh, I will, I will we'll comment Maxwell's equations that can be solved essentially exactly for linear media. You know, in a nonlinear media, an example I like to use of that is arcs and sparks. Uh, that, that that takes some more work, and you can't. It, it becomes difficult to get exact answers. But uh, for linear media, uh, uh, Maxwell's equations work essentially exact, and uh, for for our purposes, essentially exact. And uh, for nonlinear media, you can get into chaos theory and various other things that uh, can be quite interesting. But that's that's beyond me. That's, I work with linear. Um, I'm, not, I, I'm probably not answering the question, but. A question from Jay, uh, which forms of a Maxwell's equation do you find most useful, differential or integral? I use the integral form most of the time, uh, virtually all the time, as a matter of fact. And uh, uh, I was a student of Roger Harrington, who's the father, of, considered the father of method of moments. The technique, uh, he based his work on a technique that was developed in Russia, so we do give some credit there. But um, uh, Harrington popularized it and uh, formalized it and, uh, and saw uh, to a great deal of maturity. And Harrington's text, Time Harmonic Fields, is, uh, is where I learned uh, serious electromagnetics in uh, graduate school. And uh, that's uh, mo mostly a differential form. Uh, uh, it, it, it worked, it, it, for the theory I've developed, it, it works very well. And you can see that if you, if you get the book, you can see the uh, uh, how, how the uh, differential equations uh, all, all come out very nicely. I, I'm not sure how I would do it with the integral form. A good uh, problem if you ever if those of you ever teaching an electromagnetic course, or if you take an electromagnetic course, a problem you'll probably get is uh, convert take a given one form of Maxwell's equations, derive the other form. A little more difficult than you might think, but it, it, it can be done if you're careful. And a couple more questions. Uh, so the first question is from Amir. At some point, you mentioned that the proper name of a magnetic effect is a magnetic vector potential, not just the magnetic field. Would you please further elaborate on, on that and on the questions of whether the magnetic vector potential is a real measurable quantity or just a mathematical definition that is ah, calculation? Lovely question, yes. Uh, well. Uh, Faraday called it electrotonic state. If you dig into the mathematics that Maxwell came up with, the electrotonic state is a magnetic vector potential. Maxwell also called it um, electromagnetic momentum, because just like with mechanical momentum, the time derivative, how much it changes with time, uh, equals force. And if you want to get uh, uh, with a magnetic vector potential, you can uh, plug it into a couple very simple little equations, and out comes the electric field, and co out comes the matching magnetic field. And uh, that's actually what I do for, for my work. Uh, I develop the, uh, the sum, everything is a sum of modes, and the modes come out of magnetic vector potential. 
electric and magnetic field. But there's also uh, something called the electric vector potential. Everything, it's all symmetry, it all balances. It's really kind of amazing. And you can come up with a different set, a complementary set, so to speak, of electric and magnetic fields with the electric vector potential. So you have to use both. But Maxwell did the magnetic vector potentials and uh, wrote 20 equations with Maxwell's, for, for Maxwell's equations. And uh, uh, it's, it's a nightmare to look at that. Uh, uh, undergraduates should be thrilled that they don't have to go through those 20 equations. They can just use the four equations that Heaviside came up, four equivalent equations that Heaviside uh, came up with. But um, uh, now, what is real? Uh, well, first off, none of it's real. It's all math, arbitrary mathematical concepts. We dive down into these mathematical concepts, do our magic with the mathematics, uh, put it on a computer, crunch away, and out comes an answer that corresponds to, for example, the transfer function for a filter that we're designing. That's something useful. But the mathematics that we dive into, it's all just arbitrary mathematics. Is it, Magnetic vector potential is real, or is it electric field is real, or magnetic? None of them are. And you can see that very simply from the fact that, as I said in the next to last slide, um, or a, a, a slide towards the end, um, Maxwell's theory is, where, where did it go? Maxwell's theory is, Wrong, it's photons, it's an approximation. So is it real? No, electric field's not real, magnetic field's not real. In fact, if you take a look at the units for electric field and magnetic field, um, uh, the, um, the units don't make any sense. It's, it's not, not, not a physical, physical, uh, we'll go, go right into a quantum theory of, of uh, 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 Schrodinger's uh, equation and um, uh, a, a pot expression for a photon in the mathematics is the square root of a complex probability. You know, flip a coin, probability is 0.5, it comes up heads. How about if we're 0.3 plus J 0.8? What does that mean? I don't know. But that's what, uh, what a photon is, is the square root of a complex probability and no idea what that physically means. So uh, uh, what, what is real? Uh, none of it's real. But it all works really, really well when we need to predict something that is real, that we can measure. Uh, so, uh, you know, when I started uh, uh, graduate school in electromagnetics, I thought, at last, I'm going to be able to find out why a magnet attracts a piece of iron. I was wrong. No one knows why a magnet attracts a piece of iron. Uh, well, uh, the, the standard answer is it's a magnetic field. Uh, okay, what's the, the magnetic field? How's the magnetic field defined? The magnetic field is defined by the force that it exerts on this little piece of iron. <laughs> or electric field is defined by the force on a, on a, a unit electric charge. So why is the electric charge have the force? Because of the electric field? No, the electric field is defined by the force. It's circular reasoning to say the electric field causes the force. So why is that there? No one knows. And this is actually a point in uh, Feynman's book, Strange Theory of Electric, QED, a Strange Theory of, of uh, Light. And uh, uh, Feynman uh, actually uh, uh, points out that we don't know why these things work. It's just that yeah, so they, they really do work. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, yeah James. So that's a good uh, segue into Ryan's uh, comment or question. So Ryan, he says, uh, regarding a Q QED, I think it is important to know that Maxwell's equation or their mathematical equivalent and using the uh, quantization procedure for photons. This is different and distinct from Newton's law, which cannot be used in massive particles. In this sense, Maxwell's theory is actually correct, even for photons, as long as you use the correct mathematical tools on the Maxwell equation. Yeah, 
Uh, Maxwell's theory definitely provides good answers in many, many cases. Everything I've ever had to uh, work with in, uh, in my work, I've never had to work with individual photons. But uh, uh, I guess one question you could ask, uh, well, one thing Heaviside did early on, this is after Maxwell's death, was uh, determine the electric field around an electron that is moving at close to the velocity of light. And he came up with that term, the square root of one minus V squared over C squared in the denominator that makes everything blow up when the velocity is equal to the speed of light. This is before Einstein. And so the fields around an electron, uh, once they figured out electrons existed, uh, beautiful in Maxwell's equations. Uh, theory of relativity, Einstein was so impressed with Maxwell that uh, he had a photo of Maxwell on, above his desk. And at one point he was invited to speak at the Royal Society. And he said he would be willing to speak. He didn't like to go do present seminars and stuff. He would be willing to speak if he was allowed to walk on the same floorboards that Maxwell had walked on. So uh, uh, Maxwell's equations are already set for relativity. Relativity is already included in Maxwell's equations. It makes you wonder what would have happened, what Maxwell would have been able to come up with if he had lived past, uh, he died, died at the age of 48, if he had uh, lived a longer life. Uh, but um, uh, what, what are the fields around a photon? That is a question Maxwell's equations do not answer. So every theory in, electro, in, in physics has its limits. And those physicists get Nobel Prizes for is finding out what those limits are and then coming up with a new theory that extends past those limits. So everything, every, you could say everything is wrong. It's just some things are less wrong than others. And that, that's, that's what we're always looking for. You know, you know uh, the standard model of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, quantum theory, uh, I forget what the quantity is, but there's a quantity that uh, they calculate all sorts of things with, uh, with uh, uh, electrodyna quantum electrodynamics. And uh, this one quantity, I forget what it is, comes off by wrong by 10 orders of magnitude. So there's even something wrong there still. They don't know what. This is what keeps uh, you know grad students busy with uh, getting dissertations and uh, physicists getting Nobel prizes. Thank you, James. Uh, so we have a two comment or questions from uh, Robert. Um, please explain internal inductance. We have the two wire pair and a sense of EM wave being spaced between the wires, but cannot a current pulse in a wire be regarded as compression wave in the sea of electrons. Then we have the gobble line, the single rough wire acting as a waveguide. Not sure what the question is, but please comment if this sparks any good conceptual description. Okay, I'll, I'll uh, give this a try here. I apologize if uh, my answer is not adequate. Uh, uh, Real conductors have loss, and uh, the loss means the current in, in a perfect conductor, uh, current will always flow exactly on the surface. It's a sheet of current, infinitely thin. And uh, when you have loss, the current starts, uh, 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 I, I'll, I'll say very loosely and inaccurately, that it soaks into the conductor. You have a skin depth, and that skin depth is associated with some extra inductance. You get increased inductance. Uh, so a lossy wire will have some resistance and will also have a bit larger inductance. They call that internal inductance. Uh, rough wire has uh, even more inductance because the current, uh, depending on the roughness, the exact nature of the roughness, because the current uh, on, the, on the surface has to follow a longer path as it goes around, under, and uh, through uh, uh, various roughness uh, surfaces. There'll be some extra inductance there. And there can be a, a, a wave that that propagates, but that's not an area I've, um, I've worked in very much, be a surface wave. Uh, not something that I have worked in very much myself, so I, I'm not qualified to comment on that one. Um, and Ro Robert then commented, can, can the entire EM theory be derived with a, a priori assumption of a spontaneous action at a distance? Uh, action. Yeah. action at a distance, uh, there, there were two uh, 
two competing uh, uh, factors. Uh, well, action at distance was introduced by Newton. Newton uh, came up with a gravitational law, law of gravitation, and he was not happy with the fact that he had no explanation for the law of gravitation. So he just kind of waved his hand and said, action at a distance, maybe somebody will figure it out someday. Of course, Einstein came up with an even better theory that uh, matter uh, uh, bends uh, space-time, and it's that bending of space-time that creates uh, what seems like is a force of gravity. But you know, gravity is not a force. It, well, it is a force, but it's, it, gravity isn't real. It's, it's uh, an uh, illusion created by space-time being bent, according to Einstein's theory. Now, Einstein's theory is also pretty confident, wrong as well, uh, the general theory of relativity, because it's a field theory, like Maxwell's theory. It is not a quantum theory. There are no gravitons in relativity. So uh, that must be wrong as well. This is all, you know, we're all trying to model reality as best we can. And uh, we'll, uh, we, we will probably never get to the bottom. I think we would all, we would all cry if we got to the bottom and understood everything, because there would be nothing left to learn. Uh, so, uh, but the action at a distance is what uh, Newton started out with, or Newton used to describe gravity. Of course, action at a distance is instantaneous. And uh, an electromagnetic theory that was uh, competing with Maxwell's was action at a distance. We got the, the charge changes here, so the force due to that charge uh, instantly is action at a distance, and that's instantly. And um, Hertz actually came up with uh, Maxwell's theory independently of Maxwell by taking action at a distance and including uh, a delay between the action and uh, the distance. And he came up with something very similar to Maxwell's equations. But he uh, uh, let Maxwell have priority on that because Maxwell had done it first. And, uh, and uh, uh, Hertz uh, 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 made, made his, his contributions, of course. Uh, I hope that somewhat answers the question. OK. Uh, Jim, we have a few more questions. Uh, do we have a few more minutes? Or... I'm happy to spend as long as as long as folks are willing to stay here. My minimum audience size is one, and sometimes I find okay. I'm speaking to fewer. Okay, so folks, uh, we can take uh, maybe three or four more questions. And uh, so the uh, seminar is being rec uh, recorded, and we will post it to our chapter YouTube channel. Uh, you can search, search for our chapter uh, YouTube channel link. And also the, the presentation will be also posted into our chapter uh, website. You can Google for San Diego MTT uh, Solid State Circuit um, chapter, and you will be able, able to find it. Um, so let's get on to a couple more uh, questions. Um, uh, another question from Pro Professor Gupta. You figure showing E and B fields, showing them in phase in time. Doesn't the time derivative make them out of phase? Okay, I thought I answered that question. It's the... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, we went okay. Yeah. okay, very good. A comment from uh, Richard. It's not about Maxwell, but the concept of a Faraday's cage is a well-known mathematical EM exercise. Did Faraday discover this concept empirically? Uh, I, I don't know the history of a Faraday cage other than it's named after Michael Faraday. And uh, uh, I'm not, not a historian of science and technology, so I, I know I know some things well, and other things I, I know I don't know well at all. And that's uh, 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 Faraday is is I I only have a, a peripheral knowledge of. Okay. Uh, one one of my so one of my um, mentors uh, was Professor L. Pierce Williams of Cornell University, History of Science and Technology. Faraday was his specialty. He would be able to answer that question at length, but uh, he's no longer with us, unfortunately. Um, 
then a question from Professor Gupta again is about the conservation of energy. Uh, if the fuels if the fuels are in phase, then the energy is maximum. When fuels uh, peak and is zero, when fuels are zero, how does this conform to con conservation of energy? Uh, the energy is moving. Yeah, energy is very, very precisely conser conserved, and it, the energy is moving, is what the wave tells us. It, it's uh, transmitting energy from one point to another. Um, another question about uh, uh, from Re uh, Richard. I missed the part about the heavy side re reducing Maxwell's original equation. How did that work? You know, from like twenty to four or something. Yeah. Well, heavy side. Uh, uh, a little bit of background on Heaviside. He was a, a strange bird. Uh, he grew up in uh, uh, London, a very poor region of London. Um, Dick, Dixon, uh, 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 it, it, he grew up uh, just around the corner from the shoe blacking factory that um, what Charles Dickens worked in and inspired Charles Dickens story about the extreme poverty in London in the early 1800s. And he had a scarlet fever. He uh, lost his hearing for most of his youth and never socially adapted. Uh, so he was a real, real strange person. He, uh, his uh, mother was very poor. Uh, and uh, the way he learned, almost like Faraday learned, uh, was by going to the library and reading books. And uh, one uh, break in life that he had was his uncle was uh, Charles, uh, Charles, I think it was, Wheatstone of uh, Wheatstone Bridge and uh, uh, was a, was a, um, uh, made quite a bit of money in, uh, in, uh, um, in uh, uh, Telegraph. And uh, he gave uh, Heaviside a job on the first uh, underwater telegraph line from uh, Calais to um, England, and from France to England under the channel. And uh, Heaviside noted that uh, you could send Morse code faster in, it wasn't Morse code at the time, but the equivalent of Morse code, faster in one direction than the other. And in uh, microwave terms, S21 is not equal to S12. Well, how could that be? Well, Heaviside got hold of Maxwell's treatise on electricity and magnetism. And he read it as a quote from memory here is, uh, I read the book and it was great, greater and greatest. I set about to learn it and, and so he did it. He did, he's uh, one of the few people in the world who learned uh, the treatise, a uh, very complex, long book. I've read some of it, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a hard read. And Heaviside was uh, was able to read it and understand it, and he, he developed a transmission line telegraph equation, which uh, some of you may be familiar with, and he figured out that if you terminate in different impedances, in microwave terms, if uh, uh, port two is, uh, say, 100 ohm normalized, and port one is 50 ohm normalized as parameters, S21 does not equal S12. And that's exactly what he's seeing. He figured it out. And he, he uh, worked with uh, Maxwell's equations, trying to get them down into an easier form. And uh, his uh, quote on that one is, I made no progress until I abandoned the potentials and all their parasites. He was a very outspoken fellow. So he, he, he uh, got rid of the magnetic vector potential and uh, just went directly with the electric and magnetic fields. And then he also had the advantage of vector calculus, div and curl. And uh, he was able to put Maxwell's equations into their modern form, which is uh, a very usable once you become familiar with uh, vector calculus. That's the key there. If you have to learn the electromagnetics, uh, get really good with the vector calculus. And then all of a sudden, everything, at some point, the light comes on and says, wow, this is amazing. It's incredible. Uh, Feynman once said, Richard Feynman once said that, uh, there's two kinds of people in the world, those who know mathematics and those who don't. And uh, those who know mathematics can see an incredible universe that those who don't have no clue about. That's a paraphrase. 
And uh, it is, it's an incredible, beautiful universe that you can see once, once you have, uh, I, I hope I've given folks a flavor of Maxwell's equations without mathematics, but if you want to, if you pursue it further at some point, if you get the mathematics, it just opens up an incredible universe, a window in an incredible universe. And uh, uh, Heaviside, many, many other stories with Heaviside as well. Uh, uh, Oliver, uh, the book to read on that one, Oliver Heaviside, Sage in Solitude. That's a beautiful book. It has some mathematics in it, but it's all put in separate sidebars. You can read right straight through the book. An incredible story on Heaviside. Amazing person. Thank you, Jim. Uh, I guess we have two more questions, and then we will wrap up. Um, can you comment about when to use the linear model versus creating a 2.5D or 3D? Um, okay, uh, I'll give the, well, all, all the models I work with are linear. <coughs> No linear means if you put in two signals, uh, say two sine waves, what you get out is two sine waves. And uh, no, no extra harmonics or inner modulation products or anything. Uh, everything I work with is linear. I don't do nonlinear. But uh, 2.5D and 3D, uh, I'll, I'll give you some history here on 2.5D. Um, uh, that's a term I actually invented when I first came up with my. Um, uh, electromagnetic analysis under Roger Harrington at Syracuse. Uh, I had two-dimensional current and three-dimensional fields. I had just read a book on chaos theory where fractional dimensionality is explicitly defined. I said, ah, I'll take the average. Two, two dimensional is like infinite lengths of wave guy. And um, well, I got three-dimensional fields here. So we'll take the average and call it two and a half D. Two and a half D planar for layered circuits. And then um, uh, later on, I added the third dimension of current. So we have three dimension of current, three dimension of field. So it's full 3D analysis, but it's not like completely arbitrary structures. It's layered dielectric. So we call it 3D planar. And uh, you should use the 3D planar. And there are a couple other tools out there too. They're they're all they're all pretty good. I think we're best, but you know that's a matter of opinion. Uh, you should use 3D planar tools for 3D planar circuits. And if you have a completely arbitrary structure, you need to use a volume meshing tool. There's a couple of those, uh, various techniques for those. Uh, but it's important to, to have a working knowledge of a few different tools and what their advantages and disadvantages are. And it's important to get the, get the objective advantages and disadvantages so you can apply the right tool to each problem. Sometimes you want to apply two tools to the same problem just to make sure they come up with the same answer. Like getting a second opinion from a doctor if it's really important. Uh, I was listening to uh, uh, Weather Channel this morning, and they were talking about a big storm. We're going to get a big storm out here, uh, lots of snow coming up. And they were talking about two different models: one's the American model, and the other is the European model. And they're both coming up with about the same answer. So yeah, okay, we're probably going to get that storm. So you can do the same thing with electromagnetics too. So. Thank you, Jim. I guess we come down to the last question, uh, not last but not the least, a question from Gail. Uh, she asks, uh, did you swim in that pool? Uh, I uh, oh, uh, I, I went in, okay, yeah, Maxwell's pool. Yeah, I went in up to, um, up to my knees. Uh, and it was, it was, it was July, but that water was cold. My son is a bit bolder. He actually went in and swam around with the uh, owner's dog, Toby, and had a great time. But uh, I think I think I might be able to uh, go in and swim swim now. I've gotten used to uh, colder water here. We have a lake just outside uh, outside the cabin here, and in the summer I do uh, a considerable amount of swimming in the lake. Um, I did uh, 30 miles this last summer. I usually do uh, uh, 75 or so, but. Uh, didn't, we did a lot of mountain hiking this this summer as well, so that that uh, deflected my attention. But uh, uh, if I get back there again sometime, I think I will be able to go go all the way in. And uh, just just uh, one one little trivial uh, point here that uh, people might get a kick out of. Uh, the uh, I, I asked uh, a couple of Scottish people. Well, the mountain pristine private mountain lakes uh, generally has a very relaxed uh, dress code. I asked, uh, what was the dress code for swimming in, in uh, 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 this lake? 
like in this pool probably like me. So probably very relaxed. So, but whatever whatever suits you. Thank you very much, Jim. Albert, do you have any other uh, items to talk? Uh, you're muted, Albert. Well, okay. Uh, that's all for today's talk. Thanks very much again, Jim, for your wonderful talk. Uh, we have a record, one, one of the rec uh, record attendances. Uh, maximum point is uh, 122 people down in. 122. That's one of our uh, records. Awesome. And uh, yeah, that's great. Um, so hope, hopefully you all stay safe and well. We will see you at the uh, next talk. Sounds good. Thank you, Thank you very much, Jeff. It's been an honor to speak here.